welcome to this new episode of the mini series podcast on self organizing and effects. And today I have my colleague Elena Denaro with me. And Elena is a partner at Greater Than, the collective I'm also a part of and that I have been researching uh, for, for my PhD. And Elena will help us or will engage in a conversation to unpack some of the things that have come up and we'll have a discussion on some of them. And I hope this is helpful for many other networks and collectives. But first of all, Elena, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit, share a few words about you. What took you here to this journey? Um, Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Um, My, where to start? Mm, I'm really excited that you're doing this podcast, Lisa, because my entry into the world of decentralized and self-organizing uh, also started for me from academic research. Um, I had done a master's in sustainable development and had got really interested in peer-to-peer networks and sharing economy, collaborative economy things, uh, which led me to a PhD in sociology to research collaborative economy models. And through that, I actually had already known about WeShare, but through that, I deepened my relationship with WeShare, which is one of the networks that um, led to the birth of Greater Than through relational fe- relational fields. And um, I did an ethnographic case study about a year and a half deeply in- involved in the WeShare network, um, researching their visions of the future and how that was co-produced with the practices that they were experimenting with, of which decentralized governance and self-organizing was um, really, really, really big component. And so research is really important to me um, as well as the topics. Um, I then never ended up finishing my PhD. Um, I struggled quite a lot with burnout and realized that 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 dynamic of being the kind of separate researcher, even in a very participatory um, and ethnographic approach still felt really detached for me. And um, eventually took a few years of doing some wonders of other things. And, but my heart was, was still in these topics. And so, and the relationships that I had built had, had already been pretty strong foundations. And so uh, once my, mental health and um, I guess confidence as well, you'd say, started to build back up. Um, And I gave myself the license to to pursue working in the things that really mattered to me. Uh, By this point, Greater Than had already been founded. And so Fran and Susan and a few others were kind of calling me in and eventually I took the plunge and that was in 2019. Um, And it's been a a joy and a privilege to be in really experiential learning with this, with this group of people around how to build and deepen these practices. Um, But I remember the day when you told me you were going to do a PhD and I was so excited because I was like, I still really believe in the importance and the value of doing this research. It's just wasn't necessarily the place that I was meant to be in. Awesome. Thank you, Elena. Yeah. It's so great uh, that you agreed to this podcast because exactly you bring all of these experience from both the research field in which I have feeling you're much more, yes, like uh, you, you're you very um, accurate with the nuances and understanding that you have a very solid uh, base there and also your long-term experience with networks and collectives. So yeah, excited to dive into this with you. So yeah. Speaking of which, um, maybe you can, I know you, this is a conversation, but I would love to hear a little bit more about that origin story why why did you want to do this research what is the heart of this research for you and what really have you been finding Mm -hmm. yeah um so the motivation for this research was me wanting to better understand what was going on in the practice i'm a practitioner at heart i do believe research is important these moments of reflection that i get by by doing this phd but it was for us and then also when we work with partners, how we approach decentralization or self-organizing that we use, you know, like these different models in which we have pieces like decision-making and vision or purpose or whatever. So we have these different areas 
Mm. And for me, it was always, you know, the most important thing for self-organizing, even all of this is super important. If you don't have it, I don't think you get uh, to make it work, but it's like the most important thing was kind of like going through the cracks of those things, which were the relationships that we had, the emotions um, that we have as human beings and that we have collectively. And then I thought, wow, um, yeah, I really need to look into this because I feel very cold. And I think that the reason why it's so important to me, it's because there was a time I didn't see myself as a very emotional uh, being. It was more like, oh, you know, I'm like cold and distant, all of that. <laughs> like some uh, massive bullshit. And, uh, <laughs> and I think that what I'm looking for is um, like a healthier relationship with emotions also understanding why they are useful and necessary and just the core part of us also helps me you know just be with them and and yeah I have seen like how much further relationships can go obviously well we have the whole Brene Brown vulnerability um, stories there but yeah I think it has to do with um, with this motivation of understanding uh, I'm, I'm working with self-organizing but I'm and I have some tools, but there's something missing. And I still don't know exactly how to work with it on a, on a practical level. Maybe that's a, another a question or we do have tools and mechanisms, but yeah, I have, it's not something you can work with directly. It's a bit like culture mm. in a way. And so that's why it's, it's, it, it goes away so easily. It's like it escapes in a way. And, and then this personal uh, motivation. So that's why... That's why I started this. And then I found also some very good research uh, from Ben Resch, who will be in the podcast and who was dealing with these types of collectives and with the topic of relationships. So I thought, ah, you know, it's a thing. So if it's a thing, I'm, let's say, allowed to look into it and and yeah, just see what comes up in, in greater than what do we have there in these terms. And so what have you... First of all, just really appreciate the like the blending of that personal as well as the theoretical interest in the investigation. Um, and I'm just, yeah, really curious. What are the things that you have as you've been inquiring? And and also like maybe it's also worth mentioning you haven't just been inquiring on this alone. It's really been a a, a collective inquiry that you've been guiding us through. Um, and I know you've done a lot of one to one interviews, but we've also had a series of collective reflections and sense-making sessions whereby it's I feel like we've been in this inquiry with you and I think that's been really rich in and of itself just like that process so yeah, yeah. what have been the things that have been the big findings for you so far yeah absolutely thank you for bringing that up I haven't mentioned it uh, that's true like uh, it's participatory action research so it was basically led by what came up from the group and it also had this goal of supporting us as a collective in talking more about this, bring it more on the table, which we will talk about later, I guess, that I think it has happened also in a very natural way. Like it was a sort of very interesting moment in which these sort of topics were starting to be brought to the center and maybe we were very hungry for it. So yeah, we'll, we'll get to that, but definitely uh, research led uh, by my colleagues. But at the same time, it's important to say that I'm an individual and all of these are my ways of understanding what I have witnessed and experienced and what has been said to me. So it's social sciences, but at the end of the day is an interpretation yeah. of, of all of that. So I'm yeah very aware of that. And um, yeah, I can dive into a few of the points that I think were interesting uh, yeah. from, from the practice and the theory. So the first one is from a very practical perspective that I had, as you said, the chance to do one-on-ones with all the members, I think I was missing well, just like one, um, to understand where do we stand, what is important, what, uh, how do emotions show up for you, what is missing, so all of these things. But having these sorts of processes, I think, yeah, that I have the feeling I would like to do one more and maybe it would not be on emotions, but and on whatever topic or just understand what's important now. And that I think that in a collective that is so decentralized as we are and also geographically and we're asynchronously 
most of the time having the chance of talking to people one-on-one -on -one and then trying to make sense on that is so valuable because we don't have enough spaces where this happens or the time is limited and then even in the one-on-ones that you have then you, you don't talk to everyone on that specific thing so that's something that I'm like wow it is was very powerful and it gets it's a huge chance to better understand people to better understand the system and through that also build up all of those relationships so for me it's um yeah, yeah. it's been a massive um learning so yeah something very worthy to invest more time in yeah so that would be the first one um then more into let's say the case study itself so great to then what came up for me or what my interpretation is is that we are in Great Sudan, we're a collective, and we got together to work together. So it's different than, for example, one of, as you mentioned, uh, WeShare, for example, which was a network that partially brought us uh, to Great Sudan, which was, I would say, like a much more, it was, the purpose was not work. It was to discover, oh. to explore, yeah. to learn, to, to find bodies that um, also want to do things differently. And it was also work, but it, that was not the main part of it. Mm. So it's very different. In Greater Than, we have decided that we're going to be working together. And that has certain implications. From an emotional perspective, what it seemed is that, let's say, the potential richness of emotional expressions might be limited by this mm. uh, working um, framing that we have. So it's definitely very, very, very different than a traditional working space. But still, it was interesting to see that uh, not everything that everyone wants to bring mm -hmm. is present. Yeah, and then this would bring me, I would say, to the third point that has to do, or it's like maybe it's, it's a part uh, of it, which are the affective comments, mm. which I have... Uh, briefly uh, described before, but understanding that just briefly the affective comments are that sort of vibe or atmosphere that we create together is our way of being together mm. in our system. And let's say that if we're limited by, let's say, the working emotions or some more emotions that are more oriented towards work and some are out of that spectrum or ways of showing out like people saying on a practical level maybe um, bringing in frustration in the system or i'm angry or whatever else uh, that comes up um that then this might affect in the long term our sustainability potentially basically for three elements two of which i have researched uh one of which is a hunch but I think that could be very interesting. Um, so conflict, for example. So if we are able to be more engaged with emotions and understand that's just a part of being human beings and being and working together, we might be able to do conflict resolution or conflict transformation in a way that works better for us or even be able to do it. So work with conflicts and tensions. And these per se, increases the possibilities of a collective um, to be sustained through time. Because that's inevitable, right? We, we're living together or we're working together. We are also this, this mix of work and friendships and conflicts are going to show yeah. up. Like, Friction is normal and happens. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So that's one thing. Then decision-making mm -hmm. uh, would be, and in decision-making, uh, what comes up in the research is the in for self-organizing, it's very important to have this capacity for dissent. So being able to disagree with your colleagues or one colleague or however it is, and being able to say it, because that's when you're self-organized, you're influencing the system with everything you do. So mm -hmm. if you really feel that you disagree with something, it might be important to show, to just speak up and say it. Yeah, in some cases, it might be even very, very important. And this brings me to the third point, which I haven't researched, but I think it might be even the most important of, all of them. And I think it's related to decision-making and the capacity for dissent. That is the sense-making um, capacity that we might have as individuals and in, in the collective. Mm -hmm. So if we are together, you know, it's like if you're 
if we develop more our let's say emotional landscape we're able to tune more into ourselves but more with others as well and through that we might be able to sense a lot more and we use that capacity to understand what's happening in the system and act accordingly if we don't have that well developed then our decisions are probably going to be less adequate for whatever situation we are in so that's like the capacity to bring in more it's like a a wider gambit of information right the emotional becomes yes. one of those information sources that's that feeds and supports decision making and yes yeah. yeah totally exactly and maybe here it would be interesting to talk about the just for a moment the difference between emotions and an effect yes. so just the emotions are the rationalized part of it so it's like we feel something and then we name it ah, this is anger or this is joy or this is whatever but there's something with effect that is this transmission. Uh, it's before. So it's like, exactly, we're talking now and I might get goosebumps. That's that's effect before I name what it is. And it happens, especially it's easier if you're in person, of course. And then there is something that builds up. Like you, you sense something is there in the room. And before you can name it, it's already there. So if we could tune into that more... Yeah, what are the you know the the massive information that that could could give us as a group? Yeah, it gives yeah. me goosebumps. <laughs> exactly, and um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it at those three by now. There are a couple more things, but maybe I don't know if you want to discuss any of those, um, reflect, or give any resonance that you might have, or even disagree. Disagreement is very welcome. Yeah. So do so. I think uh, I'll maybe try and go yeah. one by one just to not miss anything juicy, but I think that um, I couldn't agree more with the fact that there is, there's so much value in just taking the time to be in this kind of exploration. Um, we have abundance in so many other ways, but I do think we feel our time scarcity quite a lot in, in greater than of like, we are really decentralized, which means our time zone overlaps are quite hard to, to navigate. Um, so that time together, both in person or even just synchronously, is feels like it's never enough for what we'd want it to be. <laughs> um, and I think that there is, um, this is maybe also something that I'm curious about in your research, because I think some of the things that you've you shared with me prior are have been like almost like sore spots that people have felt around like oh like we have that we have more rich um emotional landscapes when we're in one-on-one -on -one or smaller group conversations rather than in the whole this kind of differentiator between the whole group versus this the smaller constellations that might emerge within and I think I have a live inquiry at the moment around does does the whole always have to be whole to count as the whole? Mm. Like, is there a difference between the whole and all? Um, whereby the whole still exists, even if not every single person is there. And there is so much that is contributed in little pockets that feeds the whole, even if it's not, okay, all of us are in one space and time at the same moment. Um, so yeah, I think that leaning more on how can we do things in smaller constellations but like rotating is another way for us to navigate that scary like real limitation factor of being in very different places with very different time zones and whatnot yeah maybe just to add to that Ellen, i think that when the sense making you know is, is like working properly i think that a small group of people can tackle a topic that i have not been involved in but because they have a similar issue or they have different perspectives around the same topic. So that's something it's interesting because I'm reflecting on it uh, quite a bit lately. Also, um, because something that people said in the interviews when I asked what is, you know, what is greater than or whatever that people say, I don't know what is, what is, you know, <laughs> the whole, what is, what is all of it? Because I interact with a certain number of people continuously and with the rest, I have some interactions, but it's like no one is in touch with everyone. All the time and i think that's partially the magic right it would also be exhausting if we were involved oh, no. with absolutely everything just this morning i was watching like 
having a look at the conversation on the near stars. And I'm like, I'm so grateful that, you know, yeah, these are my reflections. They are taking care of it. I'm taking care of other things. So yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. But I think that many people have this thirst for a completion, but it's just an illusion. It's just, it never happens. Even if you're together in a room, that that's not completion. That doesn't serve it. And, and I think what's been helping me is just the reframe of like the whole is there, even if we're in a smaller group of people, there's, we're still also always interacting with the whole. It's just not in that way of like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's one piece. I'm really curious about this because I think this is one of the areas that maybe I, I have some question marks or some uh, Bring curious it. disagreements Bring it. <laughs> <laughs> around this, like around this, are the work as a limiting factor. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm really curious on it for a couple of reasons. One, the question that came to me as I was listening to you was, um, in your time in WeShare, would you say that there was a bigger, like, would you, in contrast, feel like there was a bigger gambit of emotional like oh. permission, I guess, because it wasn't so work-related? Mm -hmm. Definitely not. I think in my reflection was always that in WeShare, it was a, a, a matter of maturity. Uh, it was mm -hmm. we're not yeah sometimes it was hard like to really go into depth and people speak from the eye and and all of that yeah, and all, yeah. I think that was definitely um but definitely not affected by by work mm. but I think that um, sorry go, go okay so then I think I'm understanding better what you mean which is that when to put it in a really binary simplistic way when we are together and we're not in work mode, we we as humans bring in a wider range of emotional experience and we go there more than when we are in quote unquote work mode. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a nice nuance. Thank you for bringing that in. Yeah, it's about the mode. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah, so what I heard is that we're in a working meeting. Yeah. And, you know, I'm frustrated. Best case scenario, I'm going to say, I am frustrated. But, you know, I'm not showing my frustration. It's like I have, you know, like worked on it. I have found, you know, like try not to show it too much, <laughs> like bring it, you know, small. And, and then I just tell you, that's one thing. Or I don't tell you because yeah. I might be, I mean, reasons I got, like I, I might be afraid of you thinking of me that maybe I'm not able to hold this tension or yeah. whatever of these things. So that, more in that direction. Yeah, okay. I think I understand it better. Um, and I think that what's really, well, there's two things that I find really interesting here. One is like, um, these are constant phases of unlearning. Like we've learned so much in so many parts of the world that the way to interact in service of doing and in service of productivity and in service of, all the things that we want to from a deep desire of purpose want to do into the world. Um, that like emotions will derail us somehow. I think that messaging has been really, really strong. And I'll speak from the eye here. I, I know that like, it's one of those things where it's like, I know, I know that not to be true. And yet in the moment, my own fears of, oh, I'm going to be, because I, you said at the beginning, you're not a very, you, you, you saw yourself for a time as not being in a very emotional person. I've always been a very emotional person. Like I was always the person who my friends made fun of because I would cry very easily. I still do. Um, I've not, never been very good at uh, not expressing certain emotions. Um, but I think the 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 built up stories of you're gonna make this about you you're gonna derail things you're gonna take up loads of space like that's not productive are still really loud even in the context of like no we know this is important we know this is like crucial information crucial pieces of, of what's here and if we don't tend to it it will just build mm -hmm. um so I think that the unlearning piece is really huge huge yeah um and I think that that's also some of the things that sometimes it becomes hard or like one of the things that I want to actively push away from, like there's so much in, 
even the self-organizing and self-management space of like, you have to, it's almost like prove that like you can do it perfectly. And I think that like that illusion in and of itself needs to be like batted down with as many things as possible because it's so, non, no one is great or perfect at these things. And it's not about that. Um, it's about like, you know, showing up and practicing and a little bit every day, learning a little bit more and figuring it out. And sometimes you take three steps back and that's also fine. But um, yeah, so the unlearning and the like the courage to just be in practice and learning with each other. And then it was also really interesting as I was hearing you because I was like, oh, I think that I think that this is something that has changed quite a lot. And in, in a large part, thanks to you bringing this so explicitly in conversation in, in GT. Um, because I think it's made a lot of us be like, wait, hold on. Like, let's really shine a light and have a look at this and see what how it's playing out. And if I think of the conversations that I have now compared to a year ago when you were mostly in the kind of data collection piece of this, it feels quite different to me. Um, and maybe that's also like a, a desire, but like it, it does, like I. I would agree. I think it's changed a lot. That's why like writing or rewriting the paper is so hard because I'm like talking about <laughs> things from the past. <laughs> like, And that's the beauty of it, right? Like how fast it can go. I think, well, many factors, right? But it seemed it was ripe for it to happen. Okay, but then here's my challenge, right? Because- yeah, yeah. I don't know if the limiting factor is work mm. because we, we haven't stopped working together. We haven't, the fact that we come, that the, our, our impetus to be together is in large part about being on a shared journey of the, the work we want to do in this world. Mm. Um, we haven't stopped having shared projects together. We like, <clears throat> and yet things are shifting. Um, so that would be an interesting line of inquiry of like, what are, like, is it really just about making it explicit and bringing in like smaller, regular practices? Like, I don't know. I think there's something about giving license and permission that feels really important here. And I think back to it quite often. So you guided us, Alicia, in our gathering in Croatia was our summer, last summer, um, in this like really fun, playful, like uh, overly expressive um, emotional workshop, which was about like, and one of the moments we literally sat, stood in front of each other and screamed in each other's faces, <laughs> right? And I think that there is something really important about having these kind of like sandbox spaces of like mm -hmm. going there when you're not even necessarily feeling it right mm -hmm. like I'm not feeling any anger towards this person that I'm screaming at but it's like having those experiences also being in physical space and laughing it off like having that experience mm -hmm. and also then laughing it off and feeling like cool it's where we we've like gone places and then we've re-regulated back down mm -hmm. I think has an impact on shifting the like lived embodied idea of what is possible yeah. yeah for sure and that touches upon another point which would be the embodied commons or or all of that but integrating the body yeah. in all of these like that's even like where effect happens it's I mean it's not that it's not a part of the brain also active but it happens um, also in the body logically yeah, yeah exactly yeah. it physiologically exactly thank you so you need the body to sense and feel all of that so that's um yeah that's another turn there are many turns here it's even it has a name like effective turn um or so when people started you know bringing more attention or even acknowledging okay it's not only cognition it's also effect and you cannot separate both of them the, the brain is also part of the body so it's both of them working together all the time and that we stop separating that and um, to your to your point, I think that maybe that's an interesting reflect uh, reframing what you were saying about the unlearning and if if work is or is not the limiting factor, 
maybe it's not work itself, it's the inheritance of what work has meant in our society and how through that hypothetical understanding that I cannot show frustration to you because then you will think less of me. Yeah. But that's something that I think we need to unlearn together. And I think it's part of this process of saying uh, it starts at some point, can we get that maybe like more explicit permission or whatever? We see, ah, others are doing it. And then it's like, ah, you know, get more into it and practice. I think there's a lot of it. It's practice. <clears throat> It's so, I mean, so much of it is practice. Um, and, and I think that there's the other, the the piece around the embodied, right? Like, I think we're lucky in that we have a couple of humans in our yes. system who are quite deep practitioners of this, of more embodied practices. And so they've been like, it's like infusing. I think it's like osmosis. Like it's been like spreading across the GT system for some time. And I think that, you know, a year ago, even two years ago, this was something that was really present. We were starting to talk about like a year ago was more than just that. A year ago, it was like quite actively in conversation space. Like it was like, cool. Yeah. yeah we know this, this is yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we all know we recognize that we, we, but like, it makes me think of, um, was it Edwin Janssen who talks about head, heart and habit, mm -hmm. the like moving. And I think we've been moving through that pattern with this piece around more more embodied, more like bringing in a wider range of senses, doing much more embodied practice. Like it feels less awkward now when like, I don't know. Uh, it's not just one person who is like a somatic practitioner who brings in um, an embodied practice in the middle of a meeting because something's going on and it's like, let's just take a moment and ground and center or, you know, feel in connection with each other or, um, it's like more and more of us have been doing that. And it's not to me a surprise. I think it's in the last six months, like five or six of us have gone through again, the trauma-informed collaboration course. Mm. And it's like, it's also through things like that, that we build even again, not as a whole, not all of us together at the same time, but it feeds like many of us doing it in smaller constellations is still really feeding the whole whereby we're changing our understanding of things. We have shared vocabulary, like that lexicon, that way to talk about and bring in and make space that we all have like more capacity with ourselves, and also how to notice and relate to others on that, um, that I think is starting to make a really significant change. Mm. Yeah, no, I totally, um, totally agree with that. Like the, that now we have more individuals based on that. And there's a, I think, slowly or what I would like to contribute to is that in the also rational understanding of why that is important because I think it's also important to build the link sometimes you end up in spaces where you're doing things with the body it's like well that's nice but you know why are we doing it and maybe that will not be necessary in the future but I think that at the beginning that helps you know lean in and just you know relax and 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 do it and I think regarding the this work mode or this inheritance from uh, work mode you were pointing out to, I think, what's interesting while we're doing this unlearning, or we might need our whole lives to keep unlearning this because it's <laughs> so ingrained in our culture. But I think it's just an awareness thing that, ah, you know, we're doing this thing. You know, I'm I'm not expressing myself because I'm afraid of blah, 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 all of this. That this is not professional, right? What, what does that even mean in our context? Just be aware of it and um, and then try to do the next, uh, next step. And... Um, and as we were um, having this conversation before, I think it's also interesting um, while we were preparing uh, that we said, ah, you know, is this a responsibility of the individual or it's a responsibility of, of the system? And I think it comes from both. There, there needs to be some work and some practice so that you can do these as an individual, but that the system supports yeah. that as well. And it's not, ah, you have to do it and you have to do it on your own, but it's, the understanding why it's important and and what practices and and practicing together mm. that that needs to come from the system as well that we're building yeah totally i think that it it's like they it's it's that constant thing of one can never happen really fully without the other like the individual needs to take responsibility and do their own piece but the individual will never be able to do it if there isn't a system that is also supporting and creating the conditions so it, and and also I mean, I, I love that you your focus is on affect because affect is in the relation, right? Yeah. 
none of this stuff happens exactly. not in that relational fe- like in between yeah um mm. yeah that's the magic and that's why i love it because i also you know some of our clicks are doing coaching you know like more like individual things mm. but it's like i think what i love about collectives networks and communities is this healing and the potential of growth that happens in the relationship and as you were saying like affect it doesn't happen when you're alone it happens in interaction with other beings and i think that that's just so magical and yeah that's really beautiful also the potential that it can uh, bring us absolutely so you're talking about potentials and as we were preparing you told me a little bit more about um someone who's been inspiring your research and mm-hmm. their work on the role of fantasies oh, yes and potential so I would love to hear a little bit more about that side of things yeah um this would bring us to the next point of let's say the the learnings or hypotheses of things that might be happening at greater than and this has to do with uh, the research from Bernhard Resch on uh, the um, he calls them, I, I really don't like the name, but it's like the fantasies around affective control. So it's like, I would say even maybe even affective regulation in a way that might happen in a group. And um, there was something while I was having the interviews that there were this little, let's say, frustrations or people were expressing, ah, you know, it's like, yes, I mean, greater than is great. And we're doing all these things. And some people were not able to you know, like bring in the emotions they would like or not even receive. Some people are also thirsty to receive mm. those emotions as well. And, or we even sense that, you know, something's off, but the other person is not telling us, we have to guess. So that happens in some cases. But what I saw was that there was this pulling force in what greater than can be in the future, let's mm. say. So this sort of like joint potential in the long term. And there are a couple of very specific things around it. For example, we have this dream called the greater lands in which greater than owns one or multiple pieces of, um, or stewards more than owning, like we steward land together Um, and you might be physically there or not. Well, that's one, one dream that is starting to, to cook up. But even if it nowadays, we have a a little prototype uh, that is, yeah, exactly. We have a prototype, which is very cool. But it, <laughs> when we talk about it, I think that we think, uh, at least I think about, you know, the story of the v- future, yeah. what could happen in a in a GT where I can be in different places. And there are these groups of people stewarding that land and getting more into this living together or co-living together, or even if it's just in specific chunks of time through the year. And it has a very strong pulling force. And we could say, ah, oh, this is a vision. Uh, but then we also have other elements, like, for example, you were stewarding the solidarity well, mm. if you want to talk a little bit about that and explain us. But I see that that's just a starting point as well, in my opinion, that you know, we're aiming for more. Yeah, I mean, maybe just for, for, for listeners, the Solidarity Well is an initiative that um, birthed out of a desire, a long-standing desire to increase our level of mutualism and, and solidarity and support for each other. Um, but in, in very... Uh, Greater than plays a lot with money. And one of our principles around money is really honoring flow rather than stasis. So often, often mutual support mechanisms tend to be pools where people will pool money together and it will just sit there and stay there for when it might be needed, um, which is extremely valuable and useful in many cases. But we didn't really want to go down that route. Um, and so instead what we've, it's an it's basically just a formalization of a commitment to each other that we have been making for some time anyway, but a way of expressing it whereby um when a member is in some form of financial need, which could come from a whole range of different things, um, that there are concrete ways in which we can mobilize financial resources and other forms of resources in order to support them based on the need that they have that's emerging. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we're guaranteeing anything because it's not about guaranteeing, but it's a, or like guaranteeing an outcome. It's about guaranteeing that support and the like, you have people you can go to who will figure out a plan with you to to find out what is possible to mobilize within the system. Um, and it's really exciting because we're we're now seeing two, maybe three 
requests coming in and like the actual like oh my gosh this thing that we've been talking about and dreaming up is one of the big things we were really worried about when we set it up was like people aren't gonna ask because we did it we and this is I guess same part of the same piece right like I can't the the like the blocks that we have around these stories of I can't ask for help or I can't express my frustration or I can't whatever um the the role of yeah, like really deepening that relational feel, deepening the embodied pieces together is I think making a big difference in in cracking that open. Um, and yeah, it really warms, like it gets me really excited and warms my heart. Cause like, that's, I think what it means to be, that's why GT is a collective to me and not a network and not a, like we really have this long-term intention of being in life even if not all of life, but in life together in the long haul. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's another key point, this long-term mm. thinking. And I think that I know maybe in a few in a few decades it will be different, but coming where we come from, the culture where we come from, it needs time so that we can develop and learn and the long-term thinking that I think uh, you know, that we can be. And I think that GT has this capacity of being a very like a system that can adapt itself when we see, ah, you know, like we really need to work on these things that we actually work on these things and we can change course and work on that so that we keep having this long-term vision for us. And um, exactly. And then another one would be, for example, of these, let's say, uh, fantasies or spaces that go very much uh, beyond work uh, would be the space for personal growth mm -hmm. that many of us see greater than as a space where, you know, I grow as a human being and... Um, that's, for example, uh, Ben Hadreich has the spiritual fantasy, which is about personal growth, the entrepreneurial fantasy, which is that anything is, is possible, and then also the tribal one, which is the belonging. And I think that it's quite or very accurate with what we can find uh, in GT. And I found very interesting how even if this inheritance from work is limiting us in a way that we find other ways to compensate for that and and look for the future and and get excited even it might be frustrated or whatever or it might be super happy on how emotions show up maybe sometimes but I see the potential mm. and I also leave it right because we have the solidarity wall which is working we have the prototype for the greater land so it's not just talking like we're really engaging with this work in many different ways so that's super interesting. And I, I find this framing of fantasy of like these three fantasies really interesting. And also the role. It almost kind of reminds me back of my research of like this. That's what I was I was looking at, like the mm -hmm. fantasies of the world and how then the practices were were kind of fitting with that or not. And then evolving, co kind of co-producing the two. But I think that. um For me, and this might not be the case for all people, but for me, fantasy without any grounding mm -hmm. gets like it only holds its appeal for so long. Yeah. Um, and I think that and I think that a lot of us in GT have a similar shared experience, which is why we tend to be like we tend to love being in that big fantasy futuristic, but also do the really small micro pragmatic like, OK, right. We're talking about stewarding land and being in physical you know we're, we're uh i'm also finding it really interesting because we're talking about embodiment right and like we are a disembodied like from a geographical perspective we're all over the world we don't have shared space together very often and as we've been deepening our embodied practices and our embodied learning and our like that piece of us has been growing that's translating into these visions that are wanting more of an embodied piece and I'm finding mm. that super like a beautiful mm. mirroring yeah what's happening um but like so there's this big vision of like lands that we're deeply in relationship with and whatnot and you know and then the micro version of it is we're going to spend three but four weeks in co-living in a in a house in Portugal um which is like, because also like <laughs> we're talking about conflicts and frictions, like my gosh, <laughs> there's yeah. a whole other kettle of fish, right? Like, um, but going in with this like curious, tender, like 
let's just let's let's throw a couple things in and see what happens and then we'll learn from that and then we'll evolve the fantasy in but i i think this this the power of that fantasy in holding purpose is really is really i'm i'm very curious to keep exploring that like what are the roles that these things have for us and how does it keep us together how does it keep us in practice as well like what motivates us to do more practice on other things and it kind of makes me think of that conflict piece that you were talking about from the effective commons one which i would say when i first came into greater than that was probably our biggest learning edge like or the thing that not wasn't even a learning edge like it was just not something that we knew how to do very well um and I'm not saying we know how to do it well now because it's still, I think, a learning piece. <clears throat> but I do think that I've experienced both in myself and in others and in, even in conflicts that I haven't been involved in at all, like a much bigger willingness to go there. Um, and repair is like one of the most important things. And like, it's even in like just human relationships, right? Like, the thing that's the biggest indicator of whether things like a romantic relationship will be a long lasting one is the capacity to repair. And I think that that's true of just any human relationship. The more you can experience the capacity to repair, like it allows you to like go into so much more place. And I think that so many organizations nowadays do not have that capacity and don't know how to do that in a way that is actually repairing rather than just like patchwork. Um, yeah. And I think that you can't do that. You can't do meaningful repair without bringing in the full gambit of the emotional experience and the affect in between. Because that's the thing that needs repairing. Absolutely. What a nice place to live it at. <laughs> Elena, thank you so much. Um, also, that knowing that you have played such a big role in in building that capacity for conflict and uh, tension. Not I know easy. because I heard it's it. I heard it easy, in the are you? So. I assure you, I was um, a little anecdote maybe to leave. Like I literally was on a call. I was on a I was on a call with two of my colleagues because I I reached out for support because there's um, a tension I'm tending to at the minute, and I had a, I called them for support, and I spent most of the time in tears I was at an airport <laughs> uh, but I was like I know I need to sort this out and I'm struggling to figure it out I can't see my part in it um and my colleagues just held me and helped like you know they listened they helped me parse up a little bit and then they offered support to be in mediation with me and this person and like it's hard like that that's all this stuff hits heavy on my heart on my body but the f I don't think we would have been able to, I don't think I would have been able to and I don't think the people that I was in conversation would have been able to do what happened two days ago had we not been for the last year and a bit really inviting ourselves into much richer spaces on this on this work so yay cry together <laughs> that's my <laughs> tip absolutely yes <laughs> So yeah, thank you so much for this conversation and um, helping me bring out some of the learnings and also reflecting on GT and bringing your own insights and uh, understanding of things. Uh, I think it was super valuable. And even with this, I can rewrite some parts of the paper. So even at that level, uh, that was super helpful. And I said, I think that, yeah, will also be very helpful for other collectives. And I'm also dreaming already about a part two, more things to discuss. Then. No, thank you, Elisa. And thank you so much for like bringing this work and stewarding it so beautifully and now bringing it out into the to the wider world. That's really exciting. Thank you so much. Ta-ta. Ta -ta. Ta -ta.